Okay, so what is anxiety? What is anxiety? Well, let's look at things in this perspective. If we look at fear, so what is a fear? A fear is a short-term emotional state. You could say it's a negative emotional state if you want to frame it that way, uh, and it's triggered by an immediate danger. So, for example, if you just had a, you know, if there was a wild dog um, chasing you, some of a weapon coming towards you, a dangerous spider, um, snake. So it's immediate. You can see it. It's a dangerous, powerful stimulus. It's visible. Okay. Uh, anxiety is an uncomfortable state. The same sort of state, by the way. Um, the only difference is, is that it, it continues and it's triggered by anticipation. So there is no wild dog, there is no spider, there is no snake, but you still react like a stimulus. It can be internal or external. Uh, internal um, or external. But the point being is that they both have the same biological response. Okay, you know when you sort of you, you, ha you sort of see danger and what happens when you see danger you start to react in your biological response it's the same response with anxiety but anxiety is not real it's real to the person but not real in terms of the impending threats there's no immediate threat so the brain can't locate it in space and time and that's the sort of challenge and that sort of sort of clarifies and clears uh, that up now there is a diagnostic criteria I might add uh, for, for the therapist in, in the group who are probably aware of that, for those who aren't in therapy, um, the criteria for anxiety disorders are in the DCM-5 and the ICD-10. And they have a series of classification. The ICD is basically the World Health Organization, written by them. It's not just mental disorders, it's also diseases and conditions medically. The DCM-5 is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Disorders, used by clinicians and psychiatrists to diagnose psychiatric illnesses. That's what they generally use. Um, it's published by the American Psychiatric Association and it covers all categories of mental health for both adults and children. So if you go to a mental health practitioner, um, psychiatrist, they're gonna use either or. Now, in America, they're gonna use the DSM-5 more so than probably what they would do here. Um, but equally here, they'll use that too. So the reason I mentioned that is obviously um, the clinicians will have and use the DCM, ICD, as well as uh, other diagnostic uh, protocols like questionnaires to come to the conclusion. Uh, and they'll look at your symptoms, for example, um, and behavior to see if it meets the criteria. And obviously from there, um, they have an outline. Now, the five gives the professional criteria that they can sort of work with. Uh, we won't go into the criteria um, because of time and so on and so forth. It's not applicable to the seminar we're covering today. Um, but for anxiety, they come in three categories. And the three categories now, <coughs> part of DSM-5, uh, anxiety, obsessive compulsive, and trauma and stress related disorders. Now, you can see there's subcategories, but generally speaking, you can see a whole list of types of anxieties separation, social phobia, um, and anxiety, social anxiety, agoraphobia, OCD, post-traumatic stress. So it's, it's broken down in that sort of category. Um, it helps the professional diagnose the condition. So they, they, they're looking at a criteria and you're telling them what you're experiencing. Now, this doesn't apply to me, okay? And I'll mention why uh, shortly. Um, because this applies to if you go down the, the clinical road. Now I do a lot of work in performance anxiety for sport and business. But equally in saying that, I'm always happy to help people if they refer them to me if it's appropriate to work with me if they're coming through the system. My door is always open and I'm always happy to say, well this is what my experience is. Um, if it's appropriate to help the person, then I will. Um, but the point being is that that's what's gonna be used by a Professional, if you go down the GP road, you get referred to a psychiatrist, psychologist. They're generally going to go down that road of a criteria and assessment and a judgment to make a diagnosis. Now, uh, they're going to ask about your symptoms and they're going to use these self report questionnaires. Okay? Uh, and they're going to go in the UK anyway. You've got NICE guidelines, what they call, organization called NICE, um, and basically they um, have certain scales 
a NICE stands for National Institute of Clinical Excellence, and they've got evidence-based recommendations for professionals to use. So I say that, and the reason I mention that is because even though I tend to work on performance anxiety, and I get sometimes people who get referred to me who are in the system and gone through the system, I always tell the person, go see a GP before you come and see me. Okay, and there's a strong reason for that. Even if they come to me for performance and they say, well, you know what, I'm anxious about presenting. I'm anxious about this football game coming up. I'm anxious about going for an interview. I'll still say, well, have you gone to see a clinician? And they'll say, well, why is that appropriate to, to me? Um, and, and I'll sort of make a case for it. Now, even if someone comes along to see me, um, from a clinical point of view, they've gone through the conventional role. Um, and basically, um, they've gone through conventional road uh, about years ago. One example, a young girl comes to see me with severe anxiety, very debilitating, uh, to the point she wouldn't leave the house. She was getting clinical help, but wasn't, was, she was treatment resistant, uh, and then she decided to come and work with me. Um, and basically, before working with me, I asked if I could have a clinician's details to see if it's appropriate based on my remit, my skill set, um, and whether it would affect her carrying on seeing her. So there were implications with that, okay? Um, see, I, I, I am not a psychiatrist, I am not a psychologist, I don't practice as a psychologist, um, and I'm not a medical person. So I'm sort of out there, I use various modalities, many different modalities to do what I do, um, but I work on the basis of performance more so. Um, but equally there's a cross over and a thin line between um, mental health and performance. There really is. And I had this sort of not a debate discussion at a conference recently. It was a football conference where we uh, always had a problem linked. So let's err on the side of caution and you know and the reason being anxiety can be mistaken for a number of things. Um, so it could be someone's got an ulcer. It could be um, a threat of stress. It could be the young person's actually afraid of going to school because they've been threatened. So it's a genuine threat. Um, it could be Cushing syndrome, uh, thyroid problem, vitamin deficiencies, um, medication induced, neurological conditions, uh, depression, asthma, caffeine, uh, many other disorders, um, brain tumor, stroke. Dementia. So all these things you're thinking, well actually, you know what, the person comes to see me, have you checked that out first? Because my concern would be, um, if I'm treating someone for anxiety, is it something else? Not to say we can't still work with them, perhaps we can, but you would think that's a more pressing issue. And that doesn't fall in my remit. Okay, I'm not a medical person, I can't treat them for that. So obviously at that point it's like, well, you know, it's a bit like when I was delivering a, a hypnotherapy course for chiropractors of pain relief um, down in Bournemouth, based at the University of Bournemouth, they were there and I said, well, because hypnosis is really, really effective on pain relief, or pain management anyway, and I said, well, if someone comes in for pain, the first thing I do is tell them to go see a GP to get the pain checked out. I said, why would you do that for? Because if they... Six months later, if I'm treating them, it's a tumor. We've got big problems, haven't we? So, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, the medical system is perfect and they couldn't miss any of that. I don't know, but I've done my job. Does that sort of make sense with people? Yeah, and that's a sort of key. And really, and, and in effect, really, it could be a, a condition, you know. Uh, if you look at the NICE guidelines, they generally recommend evidence based therapy um, as first protocol. Um, they do also recommend, in certain circumstances, I believe, um, medication. But equally, irrespective of who you are, some people are treatment resistant. Certain things don't work for certain people. So I tend to be the person who's the last chance saloon when it comes to that, because they pretty much try everything else. And then they sort of come to me, and, and, and I'm sort of quite methodical in my approach, and think, well, actually, you know what, let's make sure that we're okay. So as a general rule, a lot of times, a lot of that's been done, but you know, just to safeguard the person, we'll go from there. Um, like I mentioned before, they've got nice guidelines, evidence-based treatments, but you know, at the end of the day, doesn't it? some things will work for some people, some things will work for somebody else. That's the way to look at things for me. You know, not not everything's going to work. Um, 
What I want to cover as well in the first part, before you sort of get really practical, is, is look at some key parts of the brain. The amygdala part of the brain, amygdala is two, two, one either side, it triggers a fear response. Okay, well, it's not the only thing it does. I mean, so much information now that talks about amygdala and fear. It's not just do fear, but it triggers a fear response. Okay, the hippocampus stores memory. It's part of the brain that stores memory. And the reason I'm mentioning this is going to make sense, to give you an idea in the neurobiology, because then you can start thinking what intervention I use. The three main responses when you have a, a fear or anxiety uh, freeze and you either fight or you flight. They're the three main responses that happen in anxiety. And one of the reasons I suggested, because I brought mindfulness to, to schools years ago, but I didn't think it would work for everybody. You know, mindfulness, come across that before. And the reason why I said it wouldn't be a good idea for some people. Um, was because I used to work in care homes in education too and I thought well it wasn't going to be good for some people because I had quite adverse upbringings where they didn't feel safe around anybody growing up but we know through the work of you know Bowlby and attachment theory that if you don't sort of feel safe and someone's telling you to be mindful well you sat there there's nowhere to run fight fight freeze so just be mindful well actually I can't sit there and be mindful if that makes any sense. So really, you kind of think, well, actually, you know what? It might not be good either that person at this point in time. So you've got to sort of make a case by case, not just roll stuff out for the sake of it. Um, at least my theory was. But you know, it had good results with some people, but with some people, it might not be a good idea. But the two main roads for processing threatening stimulus, you've got a slow road and a fast road. Okay, the fast response happens without you consciously being able to appraise it. It happens so quick that you can't even get your head around any of it. Okay, like a bolt in the blue, like a lightning bolt. And that's the biggest problem with anxiety. It hits you so fast that you want it to go away fast. But the problem is the dominoes have sort of been initiated. Um, so it's difficult because you get hit by anxiety so quick open an email up, it could be a text, it could be a sound, generally a sound or a visual cue, but it can obviously be the other senses too. Smell being the only one that hits the limbic system, and the um, amygdala first, but we'll go touch on that later. But it's so quick you want to go away fast. But once that neurological reaction takes place, it's on the way. Uh, and you've got to re remember that. And the reason I suggest that is that sometimes it's like controlling your muscle energy. With my clients, I say, if you get the anxiety attack, um, really, the idea is to just control your muscle energy physically and breathe and give you time to process it mentally. The more you try and push it away, the more this sort of vicious cycle takes place. You've got the slower response, so the information is processed in the cortex, the logical brain, and you can evaluate the threat. That's a slower response where you think, well, actually, uh, the way to sort of think about it, you hear, if you can hear, you, let's say, for example, you, know, you sleep in the evening and you hear a bang in the kitchen. Your first reaction is going to be, is someone broken in? And you walk down the stairs, I left the dishes over the edge. Um, and you kind of tennis match between the brain, the limbic and the uh, neocortex, until eventually you sort of see the dishes on the floor, the two come into agreement, and you settle down. Does that sort of. Sorry, but, um, the important thing to note here is that the effects of stress, uh, the effects of stress hormones on the body, your blood pressure goes up. Uh, there's mobilization of stored energies and muscles. So the, the energy is going to the muscles to, to fight or to freeze. Um, and the immunity is compromised too. Okay, that's another story for another day, but it's quite significant um, in, uh, you know. So there's a couple of things we can sort of touch on here because um, you mentioned before about you know different um, well different correlations to anxiety so you could look at late maturation of the front part of the brain that's executive functioning so the reason why adolescents tend to around adolescent is when you sort of start to see anxiety from the context of appraising the situation is because the maturation of the brain in the adolescent isn't formed yet until about 24, 25. So the executive functions are a bit like an orchestra. 
for the brain. They sort of the, con the conductor conducts the orchestra type thing. So the executive function is really important for logical tasks. So logical tasks that modulate the emotion. Um, so you know, in modulating fear, it's crucial. So it could be someone matures in a different way. It could be brain injury. It just could be. Um, a combination of all things, but we've got to consider that. Um, there's genes as well. Okay, is anxiety genetic? Well, there could be a correlation there. Um, research suggests that genes play a part. So there's a gene, the 5-HTT um, LPR gene, and that's associated with frets and, and the big five factor model neuroticism traits. There's strong correlations there. Um, and there's been animal studies too to show that early care and gene increase reactivity to stress. So epigenetic. So the, the nature nurture debate is dead now, salient. Okay, people, is it nature, is it nurture? We know it's a bit of both. So you've got these genes and they get expressed. So it's like the, an example is the, there was an experiment, some of you may have come across before, the, the, the rat licking experiment where um, the maternal instinct of the rats, um, the mother rats, to lick the, uh, the baby when they're born. Now, this experiment happened by chance, and basically a group of rats, <coughs> some were paired with mothers that were what they call rat licking mothers, some were paired without, non-biological parent. Uh, and the ones who were licked in that first week, even years after, showed less aggression and anxious and reactive behavior. So does that translate to human beings? Well, what do we do? Uh, well, it's unlikely your mum's going to start leaking when you're born. But that first year is imperative. That first year is really important. It's crucial. It's, the, the brain is developing at its quickest rate in that first year. So, for example, you know, the baby gets affection, gets love, gets held, gets warm. It's going to have an impact, a correlation. The baby's left there, you know, door gets closed, doesn't get fed, watered, and cries, the baby doesn't cry itself to sleep, it cries itself from a trauma point of view. Okay, so the baby, um, the myth and misconception that the baby just wars itself out, if the baby is left on its own to cry without attention, um, it's traumatic, it's distressful, it's anxiety, that's why the baby is crying for um, in that respect. And obviously that's not saying that every baby that cries to sleep and Obviously, you know, baby cries is a good sign that a baby does cry to a point that, from a functionality point of view, but the point being is it's your genes, but also the environment plays a part too. So a bit of luck of the draw there. And if you're born into a nice loving family, great, and you've got the good genes, <laughs> great. Um, if you've got certain genes that are expressed in a certain way, like a light switch, they come on. So we've got to consider that, I think, anyway, because at least if you've got more of awareness, they don't really have any sort of mechanisms to test um, unless maybe you do that sort of, there's, there's a test to see where your ancestry is from by the way. <laughs> you might be able to do that. There's no real solid test I've seen anyway, um, in my opinion, to sort of determine that now. But in years gone by, in years to come, I think that it's going to sort of develop a lot. Epigenetics is, is the future in my opinion, uh, hence my reason for going back into studying again in that area. Um, so you've got the classical theory we're going to touch on too. And that's basically uh, an old theory, not old, old, but old in the sense that it's a neutral threat. Um, it can become a threat by association. So, okay, um, you've got something that's neutral, you're not afraid of, but then if you link it to something that you are, the two stick together. Um, and that's where the cognitive behavioral therapy is built on, by adding the cognitive element. So CBT suggests that psychological distress can be a result of early life experiences as well as the way you perceive the world, others and self, so to speak, um, going forward. So, you know, very briefly, I, I'll take in a bit of a, a timeline so to, to sort of explain some of the modalities and how they've got to where they are. And then we've got the Pavlov dog experiments, so the neutral stimulus, the ring of the, the, the so that you've got the... Um, the neutral stimulus, then it's paired to uh, the, the, the food, which the dog salivates. Then if you ring the bell on the sound, the dog doesn't salivate, does it? 
But when you sort of put the food with the uh, bell, you start ringing it, the dog builds an association. So Watson built on that. I've got more information on that. I'm mindful of time. I want to sort of you know get through um, to the next part of the seminar. I can email you this. But Watson builds on that, and the, what the work they did there was he built on that what they call passive conditioning. And the experiments that he did with rain in 1920, which you couldn't do now, they wouldn't be ethical, but he got the sodium, Little Albert. And Little Albert basically, um, he wasn't afraid of a white rat. He'd hold it, okay, at nine months old, but that, that do a really big bang behind him, a loud noise. Now you couldn't do that now, this was 1920, it wouldn't be ethical. But then what happened? He became afraid of the rats and other things that looked similar. So that's classic conditioning. Okay, um, and then you've got Skinner and his uh, theories around uh, reinforcement. And so he felt to the point that um, you wouldn't extinguish the fear um, because avoiding the fear would be a reward in itself. So he sort of started suggesting that we could un unlearning it because then you might just decide to avoid it altogether. Um, but then obviously from there, people started to say, well, it's quite reductionist. It's not as simple as that, like we talked about before. Because there's biological aspects, psychological aspects to anxiety. Um, so the behavioral approaches, um, you, you can't just say, well, it's down to the behavior itself. It's more complicated than that. So behavioral approach is that you're a clean slate at birth. Okay? Um, but we know now that we, we are to the point where you inherit certain genes. Okay. Um, now, the environmental factors impact our behavior. They do, we know that. Um, so the basis of classical open conditioning is behavior can be unlearned. So if you've learned the behavior, you can unlearn it. So if you learn to be afraid of white rats, you can unlearn it. Okay. Then Beck comes along um, and he does the cognitive model. And that says the appraisal of a situation, how you appraise it, your perception of a situation. So it's not the situation itself, it's your appraisal. Like you say you walk down the street at lunchtime, you see your best friend, they walk straight past you, you could think they're ignoring you, and behavior you might send them a nasty text, you could think well they haven't seen you and say you're okay, uh, you could think of one or the other or both. But at that point, he looks at the appraisal of the situation and he builds on the work of Ellis. Okay? And you got this sort of mesh. You got the situation, then the cascade of interconnected mesh. You got emotions, behavior, and physiology. This sort of mesh that you can sort of, the, the ABC model, uh, if you will. Um, a couple of more points. So, Wolf in 1958, he talked about systemic desensitization, where you can expose the person to fear in a moderate way, gradually and you might start getting used to it. So it's kind of okay, it builds on the, the, the theory, the Skinner saying you're going to avoid it as a reward, but actually facing it. But not throwing you into the deep end. If you're afraid of spiders, putting 100 spiders in the room with you, maybe putting a spider in the back of the wall as a toy spider and gradually going towards it. Okay? Um, and, and they term the process exposure treatment um, Fowler and Kozak in 86. So what I would say for me, the long and short of it, before we sort of touch on the neurobiology and have a break and come back and do some technical stuff, um, for the therapists in the group, you might want to keep an eye out for disciplinary imperialism, people who have academic backgrounds who claim a privilege you and help with behavior, because there's not really one thing. What works for one person doesn't work for somebody else, what doesn't work for one person doesn't work for somebody else. It's more complex than that. It's not one size fits all, okay? So we tend to look at things biologically, um, you know, infection, trauma, hormone, nutrition, psychologically, emotion, attitude, belief, social factors. So they all combinate in one way to formulate behavior. Um, so we want to sort of think beyond the reduction of saying, okay, uh, explain things in one way. Whether it's a medical person, whether it's a, uh, a chakra person, a Reiki person, Irrespective of who they are, uh, we really, I don't think anyone can explain things in one way. Okay, so that's why we really should all be working together. Because you've got anxiety, you go to the doctor, 
um, they might think, okay, it's down to biological. Now, things have changed a lot, by the way, over the years, and that's not sort of condemning or dooming anybody. I'm just saying the way they're going to see things professionally could be this way. So the doctor's going to think more biological. Gene uh, intervention is probably necessary. The psychologist will think, okay, you've got anxiety. It could be coping strategies. Work on the appraisal. Sociologists might say, let's analyse the environment and focus on changing the environment. Well, who's wrong? Well, they could all be right to a degree. Okay? There's not one way of, of addressing the issue. So, you know, um, one way we do things in this area we're going to sort of touch on is, is everyone's different. So we're going to look at, what, look at various modalities that can be quite useful uh, going forward. Before we do that, I'm going to sort of quickly touch on some key moments, so the, the theoretical side uh, going forward. So very, very briefly, um, because after the break I'm going to show you some models that are quite useful uh, for anxiety in the right circumstances and right situations and according to one's remit. So if you're a coach, <laughs> use an extension of what you do. If you're a psychiatrist, extension of what you do. If you're a teacher, extension of what you do. Okay, extension to your remit is the key. Um, I think it's really important. Um, you know, if you're a coach and someone says, I'm really anxious, you might say, well, have you seen your GP first? Uh, and see what they've got to say. You get a referral and you can sort of help the person the best you can. So, uh, very briefly, we'll look at their response from a scientific point of view. And then we'll sort of um, look at things more, more in a structured way, more in a practical way. So, I talked before about the thalamus part of your brain. Uh, and that gets information from your senses. Sight and sound goes to the, the inner fear response. Okay? So you see someone running towards you. Let's say you saw someone running towards you, pointing at you, screaming. What do you think your first response might be? They're screaming at you, running towards you. Well, you might be a bit afraid. You might be a bit afraid, exactly. You, you, know, you sort of see them, you hear them. Um, smell goes straight to the amygdala. It doesn't go to the phalanx. And that's really important because it can, a smell can invoke a really powerful emotion. Okay? Um, and that's why you get these advertising campaigns for like, you know, aftershave and fragrance. They have these really raunchy ads, but it's deliberately done because they know um, the way that works. Okay? That's not certain. Um, the thalamus is a central point for sights and sounds. It breaks in the data coming in by colour and shape. Okay, auditory data by volume and discord. Okay, so the person's running at you, and they're pointing at you and they're shouting, you're breaking it down. Um, the thalamus then signals the cortex to give it meaning. Because if you didn't have any meaning, you wouldn't know what the person's doing. But you've got an idea, it doesn't look good if they're coming at you. Um, and then you can sort of start to consciously appraise. And you find, well, actually, are they coming after me? Because you look behind you, it could be the person behind me, and you see different things, and then you sort of notice that your wallet's not in your pocket, and actually the person running towards you is shouting at you, pointing, saying the dog has got your wallet, and you think, well actually, you know what? He's not, or she's not coming after me. They're trying to tell me. Does that sort of make sense? So, you know, um, so the prefrontal cortex, the logical brain, um, is crucial for switching off the anxiety response. And that's what we do after the break when we look at work around that area. The prefrontal area. Um, is, it, it can put the handbrake on. Once the response is fired, okay, it's going to run its course. At least my understanding is based on literature and I've been in this field for a long time. Longer than I can mention. So, after the threat's gone, um, that's what's crucial for, for switching it off, the prefrontal. Okay, that's why you want to target interventions where they're appropriate at that area. That's why it's significant. Uh, the amygdala is the emotional core of the brain. Uh, we talked about that before. It's, it triggers the fear response. That it's about the size of an arm, and the amygdala line is one on each side. Um, and we mentioned smell goes straight to the amygdala. Okay, that's why, you know, if you've ever broken up with someone in a relationship and you, you, you go out and someone's wearing the same perfume aftershave, it can invoke a response. Okay, because it goes straight to the amygdala. 
yes, it, uh, in that respect. The thalamus sends information to the amygdala, um, the, the, the information it gets from the, the, the sea and, and the sound, sight and sound. So when the person is running, screaming towards you, the thalamus then sends it to the, to the amygdala. Obviously, it's not going straight there. Um, and the amygdala sort of screens the emotional significance of it. Okay, what should I do? Uh, not what should I do, the emotional significance being okay, uh, your experience. I'll touch on that shortly. Um, but the amygdala sets out an immediate burst of fear. Okay, the part of the brain that keeps it going is the, uh, the bed nucleus striatum. That keeps the fear response going, those feelings. Because fear is a genuinely important response. Why do you think fear is important? Why do you think fear is significant, crucial? It is. It's for our survival. So you're not going to run across the road if there's car coming. But equally, if you, the person's running after you, you've got to react. Okay? You might decide to fight, you might decide to run, but you need to react. So fear gets you going. Otherwise, you'd be sat there just, you know, with your cigar <laughs> running after you, <laughs> cruising along, big deal, you know, um, type thing. So it is useful from an evolutionary perspective and useful now. Okay. The only issue is with anxiety, um, the person might not be there no more, and you still have a response. So, you know, years ago, even the amygdala, how it works, I was 15 years of age, I was walking home from school one time, and ironically, when I'm walking home from school, um, I walk home from school, sometimes I catch a bus, about a two mile walk, uh, and, and this guy was sitting at the front of the, his gate, and he had like a, what looked like a knife, and he starts pointing it towards me. Um, and screaming, and I thought, wow, as you do, I was kind of froze, and well, what do I do? But I sort of carried on walking, and, and I sort of told everybody who's anybody, and they kind of, whatever <laughs> type thing, as you do. But ironically, the next four or five days, I'd catch the bus home. Uh, and so actually, if I'm gonna walk again here, but even though he wasn't there, uh, okay, the next time I walk there, um, past there, and, as it happens, it was a behaviour that he did. Uh, he had a mental health condition, I believe. But anyway, long story short, uh, even though he wasn't there, he still was there in my mind the next time I walked there. I'm okay now, I don't need any therapy now. Um, but even though he wasn't there, I was thinking, okay, what should I have done? Should I have hit him? Should I have rang? Should I have screamed back? Uh, but he wasn't there. I still had that sort of fear response. The adrenaline was still gone, but he wasn't there in space and time. And I sort of did make them. Okay. Um, so what's really important is that source of anxiety is you can't locate it temporally. Spatial awareness is so quick, it debilitates people. Um, so we can focus how we can use a prefrontal cortex to switch it off once it's gone. Because you don't want it to sort of carry on persisting. And, and repeat the cycle. So we can look at ways to sort of manage it, contain it. Okay, you know, put the, you know, um, contain, manage it best we can. Okay, because it's not nice anxiety. But it can be a useful response to a point as well, as you've mentioned before. Um, a couple of technical terms. A lot of the Cerulius receives signals from the amygdala and, and initiates the response. So the blood pressure, the heart rate, um, the pupil dilation. Um, you know, that comes after the amygdala pre-screens it. You start building associations, the amygdala pre-screens information with your campus from past events. So it's, it's the memory being stored in the campus, the amygdala sort of pre-screening that and deciding, okay, um, going forward. Uh, the memory center is the hippocampus. Memories are stored there. Um, all the raw information from, and, and the emotional data from the, in the amygdala, the baggage uh, from there. And, and that activates, once the hypothalamus, to trigger the fear response in the body. What's also really important from a business point of view too, and sporting point of view, is that once that sort of kicks in, the amygdala deactivates the rational brain. It, it deactivates it, what they call the amygdala hijack, where your rational brain goes into lockdown. You're not thinking rationally at that point. Okay, that response. So that's sort of the six second rule sometimes when I sort of teach people to, to at press conferences, managers, football managers, politicians even, to answer questions. If they get sort of questions, I get them to, to buy time. Give yourself six seconds. 
So your text comes through, you ever regret sending a text back straight away, you know, so just sometimes sleep on it, let things sort of settle. Generally a six second rule um, to, to, for, the, for, for the logical brain to process it. But obviously that give or take a few seconds here and there, depending on the threat. But your logical brain gets deactivated. You go into primal brain. You go into what we call, you know, um, to, to, to primal, the, the primal brain. That part of the brain that, you know, has evolved over many, many years. We were talking like, you know, from an evolution perspective, where you're going into, in, into the primal uh, reaction. Um, so we've mentioned before, it gets triggered through the senses. Um, and and the, the irony is really of it all um, is it doesn't matter if it's real or imagined or anticipated, it's still the same response. So even though that person wasn't there when I'm walking down the street, it still invokes the same response. Real or not real. So the response anxiety, okay, it's not a real threat, the anxiety response, you're not in immediate danger if you have a response now, but it's the same as the fear response. So you might hear someone's voice. It could be an accent that you hear that reminds you when you got attacked on holiday or something like that happened and it invokes a response. Um, you might smell some type of food and that, you know, association or aftershave. You know, someone might have been attacked by someone wearing certain perfume. Um, so it can be quite implicit under the radar. You might see someone who reminds you of someone else. Does that sort of make sense? Okay, and that's the same. You might even be aware of it. It could be a sound. Okay, maybe the person hears a voice that reminds them of their abuser. Because once it's switched on, it becomes pathological. Post-traumatic stress, um, in that respect. But I'm talking about the day. The glands release chemicals called hormones, and they create moods and, and emotions. Um, before you can consciously process the fear, the hypothalamus and pituitary gland uh, pump out high levels of cortisol hormone. That's why when you try and tell yourself, it's okay, it's only a film, you know, you're watching The Exorcist and you have a, <laughs> you a fear response. Uh, it's only a film, but you sort of relate to it. And, and all of a sudden you're telling yourself, well, I'm okay, nothing to worry about here. But the idea is before you can consciously process it, um, the cortisol's flooding the, the system. And that's one of the issues that I sort of, um, once I've got, I mean, I, I may have mentioned before, you know, cortisol levels, um, aren't good obviously they affect performance even in sport and business so one, when I consulted one of the sports scientists from one of the biggest football clubs in the world not the biggest that was the issue cortisol but their issue was based on the fact that I was playing Champions League and the players were getting in late and the cortisol levels were really really high okay how much time okay cool yeah so um, we're nearly there and, and so uh, the high levels of cortisol they short, the short circuit the cells of the hippocampus now this is really important this is really important um, the high levels of cortisol short circuit the cells of the hippocampus, making it challenging to organize a memory, a traumatic memory. So the idea is really the, the, the memory loses context before becoming fragmented. So it's difficult to pinpoint in that respect, because we don't code memory like we do chronologically, time in that respect. Um, and that's the issue. With so much cortisol, the cells uh, get short uh, circuit in the hippocampus and that's probably from an evolutionary point of view uh, in one sense you know we, we want to remember what causes danger because you know if that sort of tiger tried to run after you you build an association um, but also in saying that you don't want to keep reliving the experience unless you see it or, 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 or hear it um, but very briefly when the sympathetic nervous system comes in, and we want to look at calming that down, uh, heart rate goes up, blood pressure, hyperventilate, sweat, the goosebumps, uh, you're on hyper alert, you freeze, adrenaline gets pumped into the muscles, and you prepare to fight or flight. And that's basically the response that happens. Um, the brain shuts down digestion, because obviously you're not, you know, priorities to sort of keep alive, if there's something chasing you, and sometimes the tracks, the digestive tracks can, can obviously open um, in, in, in situations because you know your primary role there is to survive. Um, now the issue is in, in the world that we live in these days, we don't have the dangers that we used to have 
all those years ago, but we live in a world that's pretty damn challenging in the sense that, you know, a lot of things can initiate the fear response. You know, it could be bills, it could be work pressure, it could be all these things, exam, all these things can have an ulterior meaning. If I lose a job, I'm going to end up living on the street, I'm in danger. Um, if this happens, that's going to happen. Okay, so the fear response is, you know, uh, we live in a world that's not great for our primal brain, I'm afraid. I, I'm not making the rules, I'm not saying that, you know, um, I don't the answer, I'm just telling you like it is. The world, as we know it, is not always great. We don't give our brain time to, um, to, to, to sort of, you know, assess things. So it's not until after the fear response, your conscious mind kicks in. Um, and that's sort of that tennis match. And I suppose the more developed your, your sort of logical brain is, um, the better chance you've got of regulating that. So the key point after all that, and you've got that, you're going to watch it again, um, is in therapies to go from malaria to adaptive state, in coaching is to go from performance so the person can achieve their goal. If that goal is to present, if that goal is to go for the interview, if that goal is to football related, sports related, whatever that might be. So that's always what we're sort of focusing on. Can I go from this response to the other response? But what I'll do after the break, and we'll have a short break, is I'm gonna give you some, um, and now basically I'm not suggesting these interventions Obviously, if you have any issues around anxiety, you know, do see your GP first. So, from an educational point of view, um, I'm going to present you some useful uh, interventions to get a, an idea, a broader overview of what the person's experiencing, to possibly be able to help them in the right circumstances, and also to give you a bit of an insight in terms of you know various modalities can be quite useful in certain circumstances, in certain situations. Have a, a brief five-minute break, you know, okay, and a stretch and digest it all, and you probably. Made a few people anxious while the information hitting you so fast. I have a short one minute break and we'll come back again. <laughs>